I, uh, I, usually I wouldn't have put you through this uh, voice problem I got. Uh, I went ahead and said I'd go with it as long as I could. Um, I uh, didn't feel like I needed to call somebody in the afternoon and tell them, hey, you got to bail me out a little bit late. So uh, we're looking at the book of John, chapter number six. Uh, while you're turning there, uh, Brother Mark Don has mentioned to us, he's here tonight, good to see Brother Mark with us, uh, that they'll be shipping to Liberia soon. And uh, he's saying if you've got any Bibles or Christian books that you uh, don't mind donating, if you'll have them at church on Wednesday night, I know we can come up. I know we've got some Bibles around Burgess Road that we can certainly uh, pass on. But uh, if you see people who um, are not here tonight and you talk to them, uh, let them know that Wednesday night we'll be collecting uh, those Bibles and Christian books. And so keep that in mind. And then uh, as we uh, look at the lesson tonight, we, we, you know, it's been quite a while since uh, we did the I Am the Resurrection and the Life. In fact, uh, I was looking back at the date of that. It was October the 21st. And uh, since then, we've had uh, guest speakers. We had uh, three uh, successive uh, Sunday nights with the uh, film, uh, the Genesis History film. And uh, we had uh, last week, uh, Ben Everson came and uh, put on a Christmas concert. So uh, time flies. So we're going to be, uh, as the Lord permits, uh, the next few weeks into the I am, the Lord Jesus saying, I am. And we went through a list of what he had proclaimed himself to be when he said, I am. So it's uh, imperative for us to kind of look, let's learn about him by how he defines himself. And I think that this one tonight is, is something we all can relate to when he says, I am the bread of life. Look at John chapter number six, verse 35. John chapter 6, verse 35. Uh, this book, this chapter 6 is filled with doctrinal truth and revelation as much as any chapter in the Bible. It's a big chapter and uh, it tells us a lot. It tells us a lot about humanity, certainly a lot about the Lord Jesus. It tells us a lot about his will. It also has some prophetic teaching in chapter number six. So there's so much in there. Uh, this will not be a exposition of the chapter, but we'll focus on chapter number six, verse 35. And Jesus said, said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now all of us have some experience with home-baked bread. Either one of your relatives, maybe you did it, or you've been around a bakery shop when they were just getting it out of the oven, and uh, you know, really, there's very little that smells better than a fresh-baked bread. It's the odd thing about it, the Western world, we here in America and all, uh, bread is not our staple. Meat is our staple. Bread is a peripheral thing. But in the Eastern world, uh, especially the Middle East, uh, bread is a staple. Everything else revolves around the bread. Uh, some of you may have gone down to the Taste of Jerusalem restaurant. And if you've ever been there, they put so much bread on you. I mean, big, big old plates of bread. And by the time you finish their bread, you're not really interested. You're full. Uh, they make bread a big deal. And uh, people would always say, I go there because I love the bread. <laughs> and, uh, but you, you take it now, you go to Outback, and it's all about the steak. The bread kind of comes as an uh, afterthought. Uh, but uh, in, in old ancient days, bread was a staple of life, literally. It, it was the universal food with or without butter, you know? It matters not. Bread is primary. And so even when you got into the Old Testament uh, temple 
and uh, tabernacle days, if you recall, uh, they had the wave offering loaves, which were uh, two wave loaves uh, during Pentecost, the time of Pentecost. Well, then also, if you remember, the table of showbread. Well, the showbread was 12 individual loaves, which typified the presence of God. And that's what, uh, when the Lord Jesus uttered, I am the bread of life, uh, he was saying a lot. And they knew he was saying a lot. They didn't like what he said. And they said, wait a minute. How can you say you're the bread of life? You're the son of Joseph the carpenter. Uh, they, they, they protested what he had to say there. And so in the, all through the Bible, bread is used figuratively. Uh, it, it was an odd study to look and see all the things that uh, how God used the word bread. Uh, give you an example. Bread is used as the bread of affliction. Deuteronomy said, even the bread of affliction. That's an odd way to put it. The bread, the sustainer, the provision, the essentialness, the bread of affliction. Uh, kind of makes you maybe do a double take on that. Uh, I'm not sure I want the bread of affliction. Uh, well, he told them, thou shalt eat no, no leavened bread with it seven days. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, and that thou re may remember the day when thou came forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of our life. So he gave them this unleavened bread as a bread of affliction. And then there's another place in the Bible where he uses the term bread as the bread of tears. Psalms 80 verse 5 says, Thou feedest them with the bread of tears. Now think, the sustainer, the provision, the essential element of life, the bread of tears. Psalms 127, verse 2 says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. The bread of sorrows. So all of these little terms you find used uh, in a symbolic way all through the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. There's another place he used it as the bread of wickedness, wickedness. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. In other words, they have one essential reason for living, and that's to do wickedness. And so he describes those who live to do wicked and to practice wickedness as people who have the bread. That's their purpose in life. Uh, Hosea chapter number 9 says, talks about the bread of mourners. Isaiah chapter number 30 says, uh, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. And so he, he likens bread to the time of adversity. And then finally he said, and not the final mention, but the one we've written down, Proverbs 31, 27 she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. So when, when the Lord Jesus says, I am the bread, uh, what in the world was he describing himself as? Uh, they, uh, they were able to draw a conclu conclusion very quickly. Look there in verse number, if you would. And remember, this chapter follows the feeding of the 5,000. They had seen Christ do this miracle where he took just a small little boy's lunch, fishes and loaves, and he multiplied it and fed over 5,000 people, and they had 12 basketfuls left. Now, they saw that, and they partook of it with their own mouth and saw it with their own eyes. You would think that that would be enough 
There's no other one who could ever do that. He had to be of God. No man could do that. No prophet was able to do it. And so in verse number 26, uh, he said, Jesus answered, they asked him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. So he said, it's odd, you were coming to look for me, not because you saw the manifestation of God by miracle, but because you had your stomachs full of food. And you know, isn't that basically the element of humanity? Whoever's going to feed me, that's who we're going to follow. Now that's one of the things that you'll find out that when the Antichrist comes on the scene, uh, he's going to promise everybody everything. He's going to promise to feed them. And they won't really discern his character, moral character or not, That'll be irrelevant to them. If, if you can feed my stomach, you're the one I'll follow, is what the masses will say. And they'll follow him, only to find out again he's the great deceiver. And uh, the Lord Jesus talked to them about their hunger and uh, their thirsting. And he said, if you, if you really wanted me, you wouldn't be looking for me to fill your physical stomachs, you'd be looking for me because you saw the manifestation of God before your eyes. And so look at verse 27. And he said, labor not for the meat which perish, but for the meat which endureth into everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. He said, don't be devoting all your energy on just getting food because you can be fed today and die tomorrow. Food doesn't last but just a short time. And uh, we all can sympathize with that. I mean, uh, you know, Thanksgiving dinner passed and we thought, I don't want to eat anymore. I'm, I'm finished for the day. And, you know, a few hours passed and you hear somebody opening the refrigerator door and sneaking another bite or two. Not long after we said, nope, we're filled. Because, you see, physical food doesn't last. And the Lord Jesus was drawing the analogy between him who gives sustenance and provision and the ability to sustain oneself with, he gives it on a permanent basis. When you feed upon him, it's eternal. It never perishes. And these people were trying to cope with the fact, him saying, I'm the bread. They're not real sure what they got. In verse 28, then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? We'd like to be able to do what you did. Uh, tell us how we can do these miracles. And Jesus said, hey, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. That's God's plan, purpose. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the odd thing. These very short on memory people in verse 30 said, they said therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What doest thou work? Now, this same crowd just got finished eating the loaves and fishes. What happened to their faith? <laughs> they said, um, if you really want us to believe on you, give us a sign from heaven. You know, in the book of Matthew, the Lord Jesus rebuked them at one time he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. See, man is always looking for some kind of fireworks in heaven to prove that God is real. And tonight, look, there's a lot of folks across this country who, if they felt like they could go to a church where there were some fireworks, 
some supernatural manifestations of God. Well, they'd go. They'd make it out there. But uh, the very meat that can sustain every believer and provide for them the filling of their hungry soul is the bread of life. And the Lord Jesus said that man shall not live by physical bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So our bread tonight comes from this book. It's the bread of life because he is the word. And uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so he lays that before him, and here's what they said. To show you how they had it on their minds. <coughs> they said, our fathers did eat manna in the desert. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, 1,500 years ago, uh, Jesus, our ancestors were fed by Moses. Now, they could not deal with the fact that greater than Moses was standing before them. So they like to point back to the, their past history. Well, he fed us bread in the wilderness in the form of what? Manna. Now, if you recall, they, uh, they weren't too happy about the manna, that crowd in the wilderness. In fact, they got so mad about it, they said, we've been eating this manna, we're sick and tired of this manna. We want quail. God said, oh, you want quail? Well, he gave them quail so much they couldn't stand it. They hated the quail. It came out, the Bible describes it as quail coming out their nostrils. Uh, we call it, I'm sick to my stomach of this food. We don't want any more of it. I mean, have you ever got a hold of <coughs> leftovers that lasted three, four, five days? And you say, I got to eat them because we've made a financial investment in them. But first day they were great, second day they were pretty good. By the third day you were kind of tired of it. And if you got into the fourth day you were absolutely sick of looking at it. Well, God says you don't want the bread of heaven that I, I provide for you? I'll give you what your heart's desire is and you're going to find out you should have took my will and not yours. And so he looked at them and they said, our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he giveth them bread from heaven to eat. Now, they look for some special manifestation. You know, hold your place there and look at the book of Revelation, chapter number 13. And uh, remember... The Jews require a sign. Paul said that. See, the Jews would never believe anything unless it was a miracle. Remember Moses? God had to give Moses a bunch of miracles to get them to come out of their bondage and follow him. And they, they just had to have a sign. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. And here this bunch is, they'd seen a great miracle, but they wanted another sign. And God tells them that they're going to get a sign one day. Look there in chapter number 13, Revelation 13. The Antichrist is going to give them some signs. What does he do in verse number 13? And he doeth great wonders. <laughs> see, people are going to be deceived because, see, they're so interested in some supernatural event. And the Antichrist said, well, I can do that. <laughs> And he gives them great wonders. And then look there if you would. He said, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Oh, wow. We believe in him. You see, because that's what we've always expected God to do. Was to give us a miracle. And not everybody can make fire come down out of heaven. And so that Antichrist looks at that deluded bunch that deceived crowd, and said, I'm going to seal their fate, their doom. I'm going to do something they're going to think I'm God. That was his whole purpose, to present himself as God. Satan, the great counterfeiter, 
And verse 14 of John of Revelation 13 says, and he deceiveth them that dwell on earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So, men want miracles. And that's why when you have some guy who claims that he's doing miracles at these church assemblies, uh, they'll come out. I, I, I could take a banner, and I've said this before, and put out here right in front of Burgess Road, Baptist church turned Pentecostal. Miracles every night, 7 o'clock. Now, I believe that if that word got out, there wouldn't be a seat in the entire building. First off, that some Baptist finally saw the light. Secondly, maybe there'll be somebody healed of cancer or somebody's leg grow or somebody's uh, psychotic sickness healed. Maybe that. Because it's something in us wants, you know, we, we can't listen to the words of Christ, the word of God. That's not enough for us. We can't have faith just in his word. We got to see something special <laughs> to believe in him. And so when the Lord was confronted or he confronted these people, they said, well, we remember in the old days there was miracles. John chapter 6 again in verse 32. And then Jesus straightened them out right quick. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. They were actually claiming it back in the old days. Our Moses, he, he, got, he didn't give that to you. He said, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. God provided the manna. Moses couldn't have made manna if he wanted to. But the Lord said, that was just symbolic. Oh yeah, you ate it, but that wasn't the real message behind. The message behind was God was going to provide you the essential of life, the sustainer, the provision for your existence. He's going to give it to you, and God will come down from heaven and manifest himself in flesh. And you can feed on me. And he said, I am that bread. Look at verse 33. For the bread of God, you want to know what the bread of God is? Is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. I mean, they didn't, he was standing right in front of them. He was the real, true bread of God. And uh, we got those songs, Bread of Heaven. We got a Christmas song in there, Bread of, bread of Heaven or something like that. And then uh, we've got some hymns about bread, the bread of life. Uh, for verse 33, Verse 34, and they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. <laughs> it's like they don't even know what they're talking about. And I know the Lord's looking at them. You know, I'm trying to be as clear as possible to you. You're able to relate to food, and you could relate it back 1,500 years to your history. But what I'm trying to tell you, that all was a picture of who I am. I'm standing before you. And I'm telling you, I give unto you eternal life and you shall never perish. You'll never be hungry again if you eat the bread of heaven. Just like when he says, I'm the water, you'll never thirst again, he said, if you drink of me. And so uh, Jesus said unto them in verse number 35, I am the bread of life he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You know, you know, it's kind of funny when you go to prison, they said, man, the old prison said, what'd you get in prison? Bread and water. <laughs> well, the Lord Jesus says what he gives us is eternal bread and eternal water. 
And he says, but I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. You're unbelievers. Yeah, I took those loaves and fishes and I did something you'll never see again and you've never seen before. And you stood around and go, what an act, a supernatural act. But when it all said and done, you were all concerned about whether or not you're going to get that, that next meal for your stomach. So when I disappeared, went on the other side to the other side of the sea, you got your boat and run around there, those on the lake, and you look for me. You're, you're hunting all over the place. Not because I'm God to you, because you're just a bunch of hungry souls looking for your next meal. And the Lord said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. And uh, for I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And then if you look there in verse number uh, 47, he said, Fairly, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness. Guess what? They're dead. <laughs> See, he said, you're still dependent on physical, you're dependent on your sunbeam bread or your nature's wheat bread or whatever. You're, you're dependent on something you think will give you physical nourishment to keep you alive. Your fathers ate all the bread they wanted and they're dead. <laughs> That's kind of blunt, isn't it? I mean, he said, you're putting a whole lot of uh, esteem in folks who have been dead and gone for 1,500 years. I don't know what's the matter with you people, he said. You got you folks are looking at your eternal life and you just won't believe me. In fact, he said, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Not like the manna that Moses, they fed in the wilderness. But when you eat of this bread, and notice this, having bread around and not partaking of it doesn't do a thing. I mean, could you imagine? Uh, you go to, uh, uh, you know, a, a place, a bakery, and uh, you walk in there and everything smells really good, and they come out and put the samples of bread out there, and you go, oh, that looks good. Well, are you going to try it? No. No, I'm not going to try it. Well, wouldn't you like some? Well, I probably would, but why don't you eat it? Well, no, I'm not. The Lord Jesus said, just me being around is not enough. You've got to partake of me. You must eat of me. Uh, this idea, yeah, G I believe Jesus is real. Have you trusted him and received him, partook of him? That's the difference. And, the, and he goes on to explain to them what a chapter but he said, for I am the living bread. I'm the, I'm the living part of the symbol you know, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So he's talking about him going to Calvary. And he's saying, I'm the bread of life, and I'm going to sacrifice myself for you, and all you have to do is believe on me. You eat me by believing. And so you would have thought they'd have said, well, that's great news. But he goes on to say, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye shall not have life in you. Now, of course, we've got one big religious crowd out there that says you have to literally eat the flesh and drink the blood. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about cannibalism. He's talking about spiritually speaking. Because when he said, I'm, I'm uh, you know, 
Uh, in one place he talked about uh, eating the Father, and he lives by the Father. Look at verse number um, 57. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he eateth me, even he shall live by me. So he, Jesus is not being eaten by the Father. People, if they meant it literally, people would see parts of his body disappear while they're talking to him. He's not talking literally now. Uh, Catholic theologians say that when they have their Eucharist, uh, their communion, they say the priest have the power to change that cup of juice into the real blood of Christ. And they say the priest have the power to take the bread and make it the flesh. And so they, that's how they come at it. That's how they talk about eating the flesh and drinking. Well, we know what it means. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about this is spiritual. He actually addresses communion. He said, this is spiritual. Not literally. And yet there are millions of people today that think when they take that cup of wine that they're actually drinking the real blood of the Lord Jesus the Lord Jesus shed his blood and then he ascended into heaven and put his blood on the mercy seat as the atonement for our sin. Uh, it's not laying around down here on earth. And yet, I mean, we've got, uh, coming up here on Christmas Eve, they'll be in church by the tens of millions to... Uh, to partake in what they think is the drinking of the literal blood of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus says in verse 58, this is the bread, this is that bread which came down from heaven. It's talking about literally being part one of another. When he says, I live by the Father, and the Father uh, eateth me. He's part of me, and I am part of him. And again, other place he said, I and the Father are one. So that's what he's talking about. He's not, I don't know, the devil has taken this thing and made havoc in the hearts of mankind. And he says, this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, not literally, not physically, and are dead, so that he eateth of this bread shall live forever. So, you don't consume it with your mouth. You consume this bread with your heart. With a heart, man believeth unto salvation. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. He that believeth on me, Jesus said, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So when he made the claim about being the bread of of God. He said, I am, that is, I am the self-existent eternal one. I am that I am, he said to Moses. I'm the self-existent eternal one. And in that sense, I'm the nourishment, the sustainer, and the essential of every life that seeks eternal life. Without me, ye can do nothing. And so he lays that out. Of course, they went berserk, and uh, they didn't take it too well. And uh, we, uh, we'll look at some of that later on. But uh, I, I, I like what he says in verse 63. Uh, in fact, in verse 60, many of the disciples, uh, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. <laughs> I guess so. Who can hear it? Oh, I can't handle it. What? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murdered, murmured at it, he said to them, does this offend you? Yes, it does. When he says, you're looking at the bread. What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? <laughs> What's that going to make you think? And then he says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth you nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you 
that believe not. The bread is the eternal Lord Jesus Christ. As we partake of him, he gives us eternal life. And not only does he just give us eternal life, you know he sustains us. And I'll just tell you this, for me, once he says, if you take of me, you'll never hunger. Now look, we all desire things in life to some extent. We desire security, we desire uh, a meal, we desire a roof over our head, we desire transportation, and uh, we're never really satisfied with all that. We got a car, we look when we get another one. Our house, it's not as good as somebody else's. <laughs> our meal, that's eh, okay, but we could have had a better one. Our security, Whatever we plan for, it's never enough. But there's one thing that you can say if you know Christ as your Savior. You're not out there looking for another Savior. He totally satisfied you. You hungered. You partook of him. He filled you. And you have no longing for another Savior. So he is truly the bread that giveth life. Let's bow our heads together, if you would. We'll close in prayer. I am that bread, he said. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the bread that you are. We thank you for the fact that once we've partaken of you, you feel that longing in our soul. We've never one time fought to look for another Savior. And because you are who you are, made that happen. Bless us as we go. Protect us. Bring those to us who are away from us because of sickness. Comfort those who are going through surgery. And be with those who travel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.